Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Harsha is going to be talking about unimodular module categories. Feel free to start whenever you're ready. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, a big thanks to the organizers, uh, Floor Shashank, for inviting me. Uh, I, I'll be talking today about uh, unimodular module categories. This was pretty much my uh, all my thesis work. And uh, this material of the talk is contained in these two papers listed here. Uh, all right, so let me start by uh, just talking about what's unimodularity in general. So this the notion of unimodularity, it has like very simple roots. It, it's, its roots are in linear algebra. If you have an N cross N matrix with integer entries, it's called unimodular if the determinant is plus or minus one. And uh, variations of the simple ideas are like used all across mathematics to define unimodularity of something. For instance, if you have bilinear forms, we can associate a matrix to them and then we can talk about unimodularity, same for lat lattices. And then uh, you have to think a bit more about how to define uh, unimodularity for uh, poison algebra, toric varieties, for toric varieties, it's, it's, there is a combinatorial data of a fan associated to that. And using that, you can define unimodularity. But my focus today is going to be unimodularity for uh, Hoff algebras and multi-tensor categories. So let me start by telling you a little bit about them. So uh, one can think of Hoff algebras as a generalization of groups and Lie algebras. And so, groups and Lie algebras are tangential in certain sense and uh, half algebras can be thought as like a average of these two. So in particular, if we take a group and then form its group algebra, that is an example of a half algebra. If you start with the Lie algebra, then it's universal enveloping algebra or the quantized version, they are both half algebras. And so uh, in a bit more detail, uh, half algebra, it consists of uh, the following data. We have a vector space with a multiplication and unit maps so that we get algebra, K algebra. We have two maps, delta and epsilon, where delta goes from H to H tensor H. It's the co-multiplication, and we have a map epsilon, which is the co-unit. And these are maps from uh, the vector space H to some other vector space with algebra structure, and we require them to respect that. So delta from H to H tensor H is an algebra map. And the last ingredient is a map S, which goes from the Hoff algebra to itself. It's a map from H to H. This is called the antipode, and we are require it to satisfy some condition. And so following the analogy with groups, this map and the map S, which is the antipode, can be thought of as a generalization of inverse for groups. In a group, we can take an inverse of an element, and the antipode is the uh, the map corresponding to the inverse map. So it's a generalization of that. But uh, I want to think about half algebras even more generally. And so if we have a half algebra, we can think about these things called finite tensor categories. Namely, we started with HMU, which is an algebra, and that gives us uh, gives us certain data. Namely, uh, we have we can form the category rep H of finite dimensional H modules. Then the resulting category is finite abelian, and it is K linear. Okay. Additionally, we have these two maps delta and epsilon, which are algebra map, and what they do is they make this category a monoidal category. So using the co-product delta, we can define tensor product of two H modules and the map co-unit epsilon turns the one dimensional vector space K into an H module. And here the action is defined using the co-unit epsilon. Lastly, this map antipode map, what it does is it allows us to define duals in this category rep H, namely this category is rigid. And so, if we have a category with these features, we call it a finite multi-tensor category. Namely, it's a category which is finite, abelian, rigid, monoidal category. Okay, and so the typical example of that is half algebras, but in fact, we can get examples of multi-tensor categories through operator algebras, through VOAs. So it's a it's a more general topic, but it very closely 
mimics the Hoff algebra case. Okay. So how do we uh, define unimodularity for Hopf algebra? So recall we have a Hopf algebra, which means we have the following data. Then there is a notion of integrals. So namely a left integral is an element H. Uh, it's an it's a element lambda, which when multiplied on the right to any other element, it's just the co-unit applied to H times the element lambda. So you can, you can think of a, a left integral as an eigenvector for right multiplication map by it. Okay. And the eigenvalue is given by just epsilon times such, some generalized eigenvector. And similarly, if you give the same definition for the multiplication on the other side, we get a right integral. Okay. And uh, what happens is for a left integral, uh, what we do, so left integral satisfies this condition when we multiply on the left by some other element h, that's this. But what happens when we multiply on the right? When we multiply on the right, we get some other function alpha going from h to k, which is an algebra map. Okay. So now a half algebra is called unimodular when it admits a two-sided integral, which means that lambda, we have an element lambda, which satisfies the condition of being a left integral and a right integral. Another way to say that is in the third point, this distinguished character alpha is equal to the co-unit of the Hopf algebra. Okay, so the terminology of an integral over here, it's inspired by a compact topological group. When you work with locally compact topological group, these such groups have a hard measure on them with respect to which we can integrate. And one can think of these uh, elements, which are left and right integrals, as generalizing hard measures on a locally compact topological group. Okay. So, uh, what are some examples? So, for example, we look uh, at the finite group, then we can form the group algebra. And so, if the characteristic of the field does not divide the order of the group, which means the group algebra is semi simple then this element, which comes from just the summing all the elements, it's an integral, which is both left and right. So kg is a unimodular half algebra. In fact, any semi-simple half algebra is unimodular. If you have any semi-simple half algebra, we can pick one left and one right integral, which always exists because of some general results. And taking the product produces a two-sided integral. So one can think as unimodular al uh, half algebras as generalizing the semi-simple case. Okay, but uh, what happens when the characteristic of the field divides the order of a group, then this is no longer semi-simple, but it's still a unimodular. The same integral that I described above, lambda, it works as a two-sided integral, right? Uh, another slightly non-trivial example is this example, which is famously called Swidler's Hoff Algebra, who was one of the founders of Hoff Algebra. He wrote a book about it, after which it became very popular. And so he, he came up with these examples. So this is an example of a Hoff Algebra, which is not unimodular. It does not admit such an integral. Okay. So pictorially, we can think we have the nicest class of semi-simple Hopf algebras, which are kind of like groups or group algebras. Then we have unimodular ones. And then finally, the non-semi-simple one, which contains them both. And uh, another example of unimodular Hopf algebra is this so-called Grinfeld double of a Hopf algebra. If you take the Grinfeld double, that is always unimodular. So it includes a lot of interesting examples. For instance, modular representation theory of groups is quite interesting. Grinfeld duffels are quite important when studying tensor categories and half algebra. And so unimodular case includes these. Okay. So how do we define unimodularity of tensor categories? So again, we had this structure on a half algebra and unimodularity is characterized by that distinguished character alpha being equal to epsilon. And the structure of a half algebra gave us a monoidal category. To, <clears throat> to define uh, <clears throat> unimodularity for tensor categories, what we do is uh, using, uh, using this element alpha, we can uh, give the one dimensional vector space K, uh, the structure of uh, H module where the action comes from this element alpha. 
and the condition alpha is equal to epsilon then translate to the condition that D is isomorphic to one because one has action defined using epsilon, right? So in this way, unimodularity for finite tensor category is defined using some object D which generalizes the distinguished character of a Hopf algebra. And when that is isomorphic to one, we call the finite tensor category unimodular. And if you have a general tensor category, there are, there are like general formulas for describing these this object X as by this formula in terms of ends, which is like a categorical construction. You can also define a, like the some circle of the projective cover of the unit object. So there, there are various uh, intrinsic ways of characterizing it without referring to the half algebra. So we call a finite tensor category unimodular if this object D is isomorphic to one. So uh, the first important example is if you take the Drinfeld center of any finite tensor category, it is unimodular. And in fact, it's a subset of a bigger example. If you take any non-degenerate braided category, which means a braided category, a, a category with where we can braid objects such that the braiding satisfies that if you braid twice and you get identity, there is no such object like that. It's Muger center is trivial. So if you have such a category, then it is always unimodular. So if you are interested in, let's say, modular tensor category, then they are always unimodular. Okay. So, uh, yeah, one can think of unimodularity in terms of like maths as an interesting stepping stone if you want to prove something in the non semi simple case. You try to usually study it for the unimodular case and then try to go to the full non semi simple case. But uh, there is some uh, motivation coming from mathematical physics as well. So if you're interested in two dimensional conformal field theory, then in the semi-simple case, there is a well-established equivalence at this point that if you look at the chiral half of a 2D CFT, it is mathematically described by a rational VOA. In terms of categories, it's described by a modular fusion category. So I call this a modular tensor category, which is semi-simple as a modular fusion category. And so this is the mathematical data describing the chiral half. And then it's an important problem to determine the data needed to extend the chiral half to a full rational CFT. Okay. So in terms of VOA, this is a question of understanding the extensions of VOA and equivalences between those extensions. But uh, for, uh, for if you are working with the categorical language of modular fusion category, the data needed is precisely that of a indecomposable C module category. And this is something I'll explain what I mean by this later on in the talk, right? Uh, but uh, how do we connect this to unimodularity? The idea is that trying to classify these uh, module categories over C is the same as understanding certain algebras inside the Drinfeld center of C. And these Lagrangian algebras are some algebras which are commutative, Frobenius, they satisfy a bunch of conditions. So if you want to understand how to extend a chiral CFT to a full CFT, you want to know you have you, want, you need a uh, classification or examples of such algebras in the Drinfeld center of C. Right. So this was the rational story, the semi-simple story. But in the non-semi-simple case, this, uh, this, uh, these results are very much in development. So for a logarithmic CFT, we get a modular tensor category. And in this case, uh, Fuchs and Schweiger like, recently or two years ago gave a proposal of what should be the right data to extend the chiral half to a full half. And they proposed it as these objects called indecomposable pivotal module categories. And uh, then now we want to establish a, a similar result as this Lagrangian algebra result that uh, understanding such category is equal to understanding some Frobenius algebras inside the Drinfeld center. And so that's where unimodularity comes in. And so to, to connect it to unimodularity, we consider the Drinfeld, uh, the forgetful functor from the Drinfeld center of a category to itself. And uh, 
Shimizu proved the following result, which con uh, connects unimodularity with Frobenius algebra. It's, it says that if you're working with the unimodular category, then we get a Frobenius algebra inside the Rinfeld center. And this algebra, if it is Frobenius, conversely, the category C is unimodular. So one of the things we need to construct a Lagrangian algebra, as I remarked on last page, is Frobenius. And a way to produce Frobenius algebra in Rinfeld center is if C is a unimodular category. But this just produces one Frobenius algebra, but we want to find many examples. And so we want to generalize this result. But let me first tell you what a Frobenius algebra is. I've mentioned it a couple of times. A Frobenius algebra is a five tuple. We have A with multiplication unit, co-multiplication and co-unit map. So AMU being an algebra, if you think of multiplication as this map diagrammatically and unit as this map, then the algebra axioms are represented like this. Similarly, A with delta and epsilon is a co-algebra. And finally, we want the Frobenius axiom to be satisfied. So we want the multiplication and co-multiplication to interact in a nice way. Okay. Uh, so just to summarize the discussion up till now, what we observed is uh, unimodularity allows us to construct Frobenius algebras and certain uh, special type of Frobenius algebras are the data needed to extend the chiral half, which corresponds to some modular tensor category to a full CFT. So if you want to think about why this problem is interested, there could be this mathematical physics reason or more generally, which is the case with me, I'm just interested in tensor categories and uh, unimodular categories provide a way, something in between to generalize the result. So I went a bit quickly there. Are there any questions at this point or I can keep moving on? No. Okay. All right. So that, that tells us about what it means of, for unimodularity of tensor categories. But as I mentioned, we want to generalize this result of Shimizu somehow to obtain more examples of Frobenius algebras. And so for that, I need to uh, introduce the unimodularity for module categories. So what is a module category? So let's see, be a finite tensor category. And one could think of uh, tensor categories as categorifying algebras or rings. And so a way to study algebras or rings is to study modules over them. And so the same reason we study modules over tensor categories. So a left C module is a pair consisting of a finite abelian category. And we have a functor from C cross M to M. So we take an object in C and M and we get as an output and another object of M. And so if we have X and M, so I denote the output as X with this triangle symbol and then M. And so we want this functor to satisfy some natural isomorphism, which means if you take the unit object and act on M, we want to get something isomorphic to M. And we want the uh, module condition to hold up to isomorphism. So if we take X tensor Y and act, that is the same as if we act one by one, okay? And so to some examples, first the very trivial example, any ring or an algebra acts on itself. So similarly, every finite tensor category is a module category over itself by just taking the action to be the tensor product in the category. A bit more generally, whenever we have a monoidal functor between two categories, then we can make the target category D a module over C. And how does an object of C act on an object of M? We first apply the functor F to land in C and they take the tensor product there. And so if you like VOA, as you can think of this functor as some general version of extensions of VOA because whenever we have an extension of POAs, we can construct a functors going uh, in the opposite direction. And that turns the, uh, the target category a module over the first one. So extensions are like uh, an example of, uh, extensions of VOA are an examples of module categories. Uh, another interesting example is if we take 
C to be a deline product of a monoidal category with its reversed. And we take the module category M to be just T itself. Then this deline product acts on this category T by we take X deline Y and act on Z, which is just tensor product on two sides. Okay. And lastly, in some sense, the most important example is if we take an algebra inside a category C and we form the category of right A modules, then this also becomes a module category. Okay. And this example is in some sense the most general example because of a result of Victor Hostrick. It says that if you study any kind of module categories with certain nice property, that is essentially of the form CA, right modules over some algebra A inside the category. So if again, going back to the view example, thinking of extension is same as thinking algebras inside the module category of one of the VOAs. Right. Okay, so now tensor categories are important and one would uh, ideally want some constructions of obtaining new examples of them. And that's where this notion of exactness of module categories comes. This is a bit of a homological condition and it says that if you take any projective object X in C and any object M, then we want the output obtained by acting on M to be projective. And uh, I know people in VOA are very interested in proving rigidity because it's hard to prove. So this exactness is like a categorical condition that allows you to produce new rigid tensor categories uh, given you have a tensor category and a module category over it. So if you have an exact module category, which means this condition is satisfied, then we can define this category of C module endofunctors of M. So we look at functors from M to M, which respect the C module structure. Then a uh, result of fitting off Ostrick from early 2000 says that this new category is finite multi-tensor, which means in particular, it is a rigid category. So one way to produce new things, new tensor categories, rigid ones from something known as look at module categories and look at, uh, yeah, look at this category of endofunctors. And so I'll, I'll tell you one example. So we, we saw that D, if you take D to be C del in C rev, it acts on C, right? So this is the, again, the categorification of the notion that if you take an enveloping algebra of an algebra, which means A tensor A opposite, it acts on the algebra A by just multiplication on both sides. And if we look at the category of endofunctors, that is isomorphic to the Trinfeld center. So if you can prove something for category of endofunctors that tells you something in particular about the Trinfeld centers. Okay. So we are interested in unimodular things because as mentioned, they connect to Frobenius algebras. So now the question is, we have this way of constructing in new tensor categories. When is this output unimodular? And so that's that's the content of uh, my two papers, and that's what I'll discuss in the rest of the talk. Uh, okay, so first thing I do did was give it a name. If you have a module category, which satisfies this condition that the category of endofunctors is unimodular, then we call it a unimodular module category, which was the title of my talk. Now, the question, so to to find out if it's an interesting notion or not, we need a couple of things. We need first, there should be some examples of this and second, some applications. So let me first uh, give a few examples. So if we take a tensor category, and as I mentioned, a trivial example of module is just the category itself, right? A, every algebra is a module over itself. And then the category of endofunctors is C, where we reverse the monoidal product. And in this case, what we obtain is C considered as a C module is unimodular if C is uh, unimodular as a tensor category. So this notion of unimodularity, it generalizes what we define unimodularity for tensor categories. Okay. 
if you take C to be the representations of a half algebra, then there is a, a functor going from half algebra as the rep of H to vector spaces, which just forgets the action of H, right? And this is a monoidal functor. And as I mentioned before, whenever you have such a functor, you can turn the target category into a module over the first one, right? And so if you do that, if you take M to be VEC, then the set, the endofunctor category is just the representation of dual of a half algebra. So this kind of tells us that uh, we have touched like uh, both extremes. If you take C to be rep H and M to be the same category, then unimodularity is same as unimodularity of H. If you take the module category to be VEC, which is trivial, this corresponds to unimodularity of H star. So it's like uh, covers both the extremes of unimodularity. Okay. Lastly, uh, what, what is this notion in, in the semi-simple case, right? We know that if we have a fusion category, which is a semi-simple tensor category, that is unimodular. So we want this notion to be similar for the semi-simple case. So if you take C to be a semi-simple tensor category or fusion category with non-zero dimension, and we take any semi-simple module category, then uh, we can show that this is a unimodular module category. So this, again, is a generalization of the observation at the beginning where we saw semi-simple half algebras are unimodular. So again, whenever we have a semi-simple in terms of anything, we would expect it to be unimodular. That's what we get over here. Okay, so uh, before... I move on, let's see. So now, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, as, an, as an application, we want, we want the data needed to extend like the CFT corresponding to a modular tensor category to a full one. And that corresponds to some nice Frobenius algebra in the Drinfeld set. So we want to connect to that. And so in the result of Shimizu, we use this functor U from the Drinfeld center to C but it admits a generalization, this functor, where we have a functor going from the Drinfeld center of a category uh, to the category of endo functors of a module category. And uh, how does this functor behave? What it does is uh, objects in Drinfeld center are just some object with a half grading, and we get a functor over here, which is just that the object acting on anything in them. Okay, and uh, this functor allows us to construct various ways to characterize the unimodularity. Okay, so what we have is if we take a finite tensor category and M to be indecomposable and exact, then we get the following conditions are equivalent. The first is M is unimodular. The second is that if you look at the right adjoint of this functor, which will go in the opposite direction, and we apply that to the identity endofunctor. Right? That is a Frobenius algebra in the Drinfeld center. So earlier we were looking at the functor U and its right adjoint, and unimodularity of C allowed us to construct a Frobenius algebra by using the right adjoint. Now we have generalized that to like a parameterized version where for every M we get a Frobenius algebra if it is unimodular. But in fact, we can strengthen the second condition and we can in fact say this psi right adjoint, which is a functor in the opposite direction, is a Frobenius monoidal functor. And these are nice because these are functors which carry Frobenius algebras to Frobenius algebras. Okay, so that means that whenever you have a Frobenius algebra in rec CM, you can apply psi right adjoint to get another Frobenius algebra in ZC. So this is a nice, nice uh, generalization of the second fact, and it's in fact equivalent to unimodularity. And last thing, which uh, I don't have enough time to elaborate on, and is that we can also characterize it into certain endo functors of the module category called the ser functor and Nakayama functor. And if their composition is equal to identity, we get M is unimodular. So this is similar to the 
unimodularity of character of a tensor category where we defined it as the distinguished object D being isomorphic to identity. So we have a similar characterization for uh, modularity, unimodularity of M. Okay. So yeah, this is this is one of the first main results. So this result allows us to understand uh, in, in many different ways how how to produce examples and how to identify unimodular module categories. And also this characterizations B and C allow us to use them to produce Frobenius algebra in the Drinfeld center. Okay. And uh, in fact, there's a, there's a bit of a generalization of this result that uh, recall the Fuchsweiger proposal for logarithmic CFTs the data needed to extend them to a full CFT was using pivotal module categories. So we have a generalization of to the pivotal setting as well, which means pivotal means we have the double dual is isomorphic to identity. And pivotality of module categories is defined again using the ser functor. But uh, this is this result, which I won't talk about later, but wanted to briefly mention is that if we have C pivotal and the module category pivotal and unimodular, we get that the right adjoint is not just Frobenius monoidal, it's pivotal Frobenius monoidal. And uh, pivotal Frobenius monoidal functors, they preserve symmetric Frobenius algebra. So as I mentioned, I like pushed under the rug, like the definition of a Lagrangian algebra and so Lagrangian algebra, are like uh, they have a lot of structure, like symmetric, and we want Frobenius and commutative. So if you add pivotality to the mix, you can you get this functor has more structure, and that allows us to produce nicer versions of Frobenius algebras, which is yeah, needed. Okay, so uh, this and the last result are like the main categorical result. And uh, in the rest of the talk, uh, I'll go back to the concrete setting of Hoff algebras and uh, look at examples. So for example, uh, there is this uh, kajdan lustig correspondence, which tells these categories of VOS representation categories. They are the same representation categories of certain quantum groups, which are in particular Hoff algebras. And so, Again, we are interested in this problem of extended the log CFT to a full CFT. So we are interested in knowing for half algebras like quantum groups, what are the unimodular module categories for them? Okay, so let first we need to know what are the module categories over rep H where H is a half algebra. And for that one needs the notion of co-module algebras for a half algebra. So uh, we fix H to be a half algebra for the remaining part. Then a left H co-module algebra, it's an algebra A, which is an H co-module. So that means we have a map going from A to H tensor A. And A is algebra and H is algebra. So H tensor A also becomes an algebra. And we want this map rho to be an algebra map. So it's a co-module and an algebra. And this condition of this being an algebra map can be written explicitly in terms of these two conditions below. Okay. And so what this co-module algebra allows us to do is whenever using, we have A, we can define a functor from rep H times rep A to rep A. And how is this defined? So if you take X to be an H module and M to be an A module, the output is just X tensor M as a vector space. And to be in rep A, it, it has to be a A module as well. So we define A action on some element of X tensor M lying in this vector space by going looking at row A, which is an element of H tensor A. So I denote it as A minus one to be the H part and A0 to be the A part. And each piece acts on X and M. So in the concrete case of half algebras, we have a 
very nice way using co-module algebras to construct module categories over rep H. Okay. And then we need to work with exact module categories because we want to work with neutral tensor categories, which are rigid. And so exactness for module category at the categorical level, it's like not well understood. It's like a homological condition and we know very little about it. But in the half algebra case, we have a very good understanding of this. And for a co-module algebra A, we have like uh, proper conditions using which we can, we know that if A satisfies these conditions, then rep A is exact as a rep H module category. Okay. So if that happens, we call the algebra A exact. Finally, we want to study unimodularity of uh, module categories, right? So we want to understand when rep A is unimodular. And so when that happens, we call A to be unimodular. And next, we want to characterize them, find a result which tells us when is rep A unimodular. OK, so let me bring back this table which we discussed between half algebras and tensor categories. So half algebras had certain structure. So algebra delta epsilon and S unimodularity corresponded to alpha being equal to epsilon. We defined co-module algebras, which consist of this data. Additionally, I mentioned exactness and unimodularity. So as I mentioned, exactness is understood because of some results, but unimodularity is not well understood. That's what we want to find out. And just to remind you, categorically, H co-module algebra corresponds to a rep H module category. Exactness of co-module algebra corresponds to exactness of module category. And similarly for the co-module algebra. So uh, yeah, Hoff algebras provide us a very explicit case where one can do calculation and understand these notions. And so uh, another part of uh, my papers was find out finding out like explicit conditions, sorry. Uh, for this unimodularity of co-module algebras, which is uh, what I'll mention next. And so what we prove is that given a co-module algebra, unimodularity is equivalent to it admitting certain element, which means we want certain element to exist which satisfies some condition. And uh, before I describe that, I need to introduce a little bit of no notion uh, notation. So, <clears throat> but let me show you the result first. So what we want is that, uh, what we proved is that, sorry, that an exact co-module algebra is unimodular if it admits an element which satisfies these two conditions given at the bottom of the page. So we want there to be such some invertible element A, which satisfies two conditions. And uh, you might, you might be, it might be fair to look at these and think that these are ugly, but when you go to specific examples, it turns out that they simplify quite a lot, but this is like a general expression and it involves like a lot of Swedler notation and a lot of different things. And some of which I mentioned over here that uh, whenever we have a co-module algebra A, we know by earlier result it's Frobenius. So we have a Frobenius form and Nakayama automorphism and they are used in over here at the bottom to characterize the unimodular element. Yeah, but uh, but uh, the the upshot is that uh, this formula uh, gives us in a, in general an answer about unimodularity. And uh, in fact, for things like the small quantum group, or if you're looking at a Taft algebra, if you're looking at such half algebras. In that case, there is a much simpler version of this formula, which can be used to check uh, unimodularity. Okay. All right. Uh, what is new? Sorry, what is new in, in the expression in equation one? This one? Yes. Oh, so yeah, I, I, I didn't explain it properly. So what 
we do is we start with assuming H is a co-modular algebra, which is exact. And then we want to know the unimodularity. And as I mentioned for uni exact H co-modular algebra, we already have a good understanding of them. In particular, we know that such algebras, sorry, such algebras are Frobenius. And uh, Frobenius algebras have a Frobenius form lambda. And with respect to that, we can define the so-called Nakayama automorphism, and that is new. So okay. this thank new you, thank is you. A, I hadn't seen that. Right. Uh, yeah. So it, it's an automorphism of the algebra A, which interacts nicely with this map lambda. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. So yeah, so this new and these dual bases, they all go into this formula and there is some uh, sweet learn notation used as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, so as an application, I mentioned that uh, if you look at specific example, this uh, formula, it simplifies quite a bit. And uh, in the beginning of the talk, I mentioned this Swedler Hoff algebra and the Taft algebra is some generalization of that. And so what we were able to check is there exists an example of a category which does not admit a unimodular module. Okay, so what, uh, what one can think of is that this example is kind of purely non-semi-simple tensor category. Uh, if something is unimodular or admits a unimodular module category, it's again somewhere lying somewhere in the spectrum between semi-simple and non-semi-simple case. And if you don't have such a thing, it's purely non-semi-simple. Okay, so uh, another way of thinking is this notion of categorical Morita equivalence. And one could think of the idea of admitting a unimodular module as being a uh, Morita equivalent to a unimodular tensor category. So this theorem says that rep of Taft, it is not uh, Morita equivalent to something which is unimodular. Okay. So we call a category weakly unimodular if, it's, if it behaves like this representation category of the Taft algebra. And so uh, what to summarize what we get is uh, this picture over here where we have fusion categories, which includes the rep of half algebra, semi-simple half algebras. We have the unimodular ones like the Trenfeld center, or if you're looking at rep of uh, VOA, which are always non-degenerate, thus unimodular. And then we have examples of weakly unimodular things, something which can be Morita equivalent to a unimodular tensor category. And so these examples include like dual of the Drinfeld double or like the two examples like that. So there are things which come over here, but like you might ask like, why, why would one want to study them? And what happens is that these categories have many features similar to unimodular categories. So for example, uh, there is a invariant of three manifolds called Turai Viro invariant. And it assumes your category to be spherical and you can use that category to construct this invariant for three manifolds. And so one of the assumptions on the category is being unimodular, but it turns out that one can relax that condition to a weakly unimodular condition. So if even if your category is weakly unimodular, then one can use that to construct the Turai Viro invariant and maybe in that case, one can obtain more information and about three manifolds using like such general categories. But uh, again, we are still far from like uh, understanding nicely these purely non-semi-simple things or even uh, constructing invariants of three manifolds from them because even the current constructions of three manifolds uh, use uh, three dimension, uh, like the modular tensor categories, which are unimodular, as I mentioned, because they are like Trinfeld center, they are non-degenerate. So it'll be nice to have 
some way of assigning invariance of manifold from purely non semi simple thing which could shed more light about manifolds and also about the structure of these things and also how this class of weakly unimodular is separated from them so yeah so i i i end with this question about finding a, a characterization of what these weakly unimodular things are we have a good understanding in this case uh, at least at the categorical level and also in examples but we don't know what these are yeah i'll end with that thank you thank you so much yeah let me stop the recording and we'll move on to questions thank you so much Michelle.